Hello, everybody at home, and thanks for tuning in again for our weekly poetry series. I'm Nicole, the manager at Read It Again Bookstore, and I'm joined today by poets Hank Backer and Jeremy Michael Reed, both of whom I met in Knoxville when I was getting my MFA. They're friends of mine. Um, so the way the formatting is going to work tonight, each poet's going to read for 15 minutes, followed by a discussion. Uh, feel free to make comments or ask questions throughout, and we'll respond to them after the reading. Hank is going to go first, so I will introduce him now. Hank Backer teaches English at the University of Tennessee. He recently graduated from Georgia State University's creative writing program, where he worked as an assistant editor for Five Points and a poetry editor for New South. He has worked forthcoming or published in Connotation Press, Grist, Red Paint Hill, Loose Change, The Rectangle, and elsewhere. All right, uh, Hank, uh, Kim's gonna make you big and then you can read. Awesome. All right. Hey guys, uh, I'm just gonna read a couple newer poems. Uh, this first one is not so new. Um, uh, not really any rhyme or reason to uh, how I picked out these poems. These are just poems I uh, enjoy of mine and hope that you would like also. Uh, this first one is called Weeding and uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and start with that one. <clears throat> uh, weeding. And suddenly a toad I'd never have seen had he been still, the perfect brown of just turned earth and the riot of birds with the wind, how it must partition the sky into bulbs and shoots and how vacant the ground below them, how sky ending. The toad winks into grass and is gone. A skull sized box turtle pokes through the edge of, a, of the lawn. Weeks ago, dad caught him at our tomatoes, put him in the back seat of the Camry, and drove him to the other side of Brightleaf. Still, three days later, the tomatoes were pecked again into tapered hearts. Mustard plant, dandelions, stalks wide as my thumb, droop their tiny flowers from the wheelbarrow, where the dirt rattles off their roots into dust. The compost, caged in dog fence, bakes under a crust of flies. I toss the weeds in, then start on the Asian pear, lousy with thistle. Dad's fruit trees grow out of their intended row, the cherry's gnarled limb propped on a two by eight. The spot we cleared for a fire pit is now a bramble of wild rose and poison ivy. Beyond that, the creek works its muddy channel through the, through the forest. On a slab of limestone, the curled etch of a mollusk fades. <clears throat> Okay, uh, that was my first one. Um, the second one is called Sweeping. While you're teaching, I sweep. Wonder what all this grit is anyway. Flakes of leaf, sand from who knows where, earth surging through the linoleum. I prefer what I can identify. The cricket's crumpled iridescence, more fur than is left on our dog. Your hair roping together clods of dust. A process more satisfying than its result. The swish, the rake, our chaos neatly piled, perfecting the dustpan's angle, exit the week's debris. Yesterday, your class learned the hecatonkeries turned to trees after the Olympians won. Their hundred hands hardened into knots, ichor dulled the sap. I'm leaning on my broom when you enter with a spent hay. You shuffle to the couch and collapse under 50 student papers. I open a window while you scrawl an essay scarlet. A red bud blossom sails in, coughs its pollen onto the tile, and you rest your pen to watch the old gods sweep a cloudless sky. Uh, okay, just have to decide which poem I wanted to read next. Uh, I guess I'll do Late Spring. Uh, this is a very new poem, uh, actually almost still in process. Um, so uh, bear with me for this one. Uh, first time I've read it. Late spring. <clears throat> Where the lawn edges the woods, a log is lined with turkey tail, those cresting waves of rot, while a bearded mushroom blooms colorless within, centipedes darting like fish in a coral reef. Nature abhors a vacuum, growth its only constant. A goldfish fills his bowl, perplexed by the water, the knot fish. Behind a mower, I duck the sprawl of cherry limbs and spot a crumpled sparrow singing a trail of ants. You told me to get rid of it last week. Trimmings strew the lawn where lizards glint and robins arc above the grubs, 
suddenly naked, wriggling for the weeds. I kill the motor and lean on the willow by the pond. This morning, you shook me awake. There's a deer in the pond. You tugged me to the spot, and I stared at the mist, the damsel damsel flies, until fin finally I saw first her nose, then mouth, agape and offering no answers, just inches below the wa water surface, sliced open by morning sun, her legs folded two feet from shore. We watched a winch and a net trawl her to the bed of a truck. I gripped your shoulder as her eyes emerged, the nothing of her stomach yawning at us. You shrugged me off favoring the willow's rough skin. How did we miss her for two weeks? How many times did I spot her walking and settle that she was silt, a two white carp, a skeleton of pond scum? The pond is skimmed with clouds, coral in the sunset, my palm too long on the grass, a maze of creases. Under the mower's roar, I barely hear the bullfrog's croak. Okay, and just two more. Um, this next one is relatively new. Um, it's called Flow. Cars smolder in their driveways, sloughing last night's snow, which has perfected even the trash. Gloves missing fingers, a phone book smeared across 50 feet of sidewalk. And I want winter all at once, a great blue flow to buckle skyscrapers like the one wave that ends New York and disaster movies, everyone waiting for the bus, now waiting to be excavated. When I was eight, I froze my toys in mom's wine glasses. Shards littered the freezer, but on the frosted stems stood the battles dictated by the ice age of my imagination. Legos at each other's throats, plastic robots, my favorite Hot Wheels mid-skid. Mom didn't get it, and I watched from my room as they melted in the backyard, my framed chaos, my unshakable snow globes. You can't make these, la these things last, she never told me. On their bed of ice, my toys looked in wrong directions, like fish at the supermarket. <clears throat> and this last poem is most definitely in honor of Nicole. Uh, it's called Minotaur, and it's <laughs> it's a very old poem. Uh, but um, you know, I know Nicole also wrote about Minotaurs, uh, and I thought you know we might have a cool conversation about our Minotaur poems. <clears throat> the Minotaur wanted seventy-two virgins a year, who were all relieved it was his bottom half that was human. As his bovine teeth made mush from supple flesh, he considered his mother. Legs splayed inside a wooden cow, making moo sounds. Minos was less surprised than you'd think, a white bull tingling in his periphery, his mother, God. When he asked Daedalus what it all meant, his architect just muttered, designed a, a maze in mud, dreamt of waxy wings. But we all breathed a collective sigh of relief when Theseus ran the beast through with bronze, because honestly, we were running out of virgins, an embarrassing thing to be out of. Like when your neighbor comes over half-dressed and asks for ice, and you don't have any. And he says, who doesn't have any ice? All you have to do is keep water cold in a little tray. And you say, well, you try sticking your daughters inside of a little tray. And he says, what? And you say, oh, sorry, I thought we were talking about virgins. Thanks, guys. <laughs> How did I not know you have a Minotaur poem? I love that. <laughs> It's just so old. I, <laughs> I wrote it when uh, I was in an undergrad. So it was great. I enjoyed it a lot. It had a, Thanks. a lot of good humor. And I love your images and the other ones. Like you have a lot of really still and beautiful images. Um, okay. Well, Jeremy's up. Uh, so Jeremy Michael Reed holds a PhD in English and Creative Writing from the University of Tennessee, where he was the editor in chief of GRIF, the Journal of the Literary Arts and assistant to Joy Hartville, who has now gotten her second term as poet laureate. His poems and essays are published or forthcoming in Still, the Journal, uh, Valparaiso Poetry Review, Western Humanities Review, and elsewhere. He's an associate editor for Sundress Publications and assistant professor of English for Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri. Okay, Jeremy, you're up. Hi, thanks everybody uh, for being here. It's really great uh, to be able to read even from my house. And thank you to Hank and Nicole for inviting me. Um, I 
often write poems while thinking about the places that I live. And so I have kind of three stacks of things that I'm working on right now. And I'm gonna read a little selection from each of the places. Um, so my first place is East Tennessee, where I went and got my PhD, but also where my family uh, lived from the 1700s to the 1930s. Um, so this first poem is called Hand Stitched. The sky was apricots, the moon a sliver, buckeyes on ground, apples above. You smell the poem before you see it. A blurred edged memory becomes clear. Fruit under feet, groundhog dirt, sun, the sky, apricots, the moon, silver. All is remembering. Orchards, warm dirt, a rough hand, the wind. You smell the poem, you see it. Words fall forward over memory. Say, carry what you have, stay with it. The sky was apricots, the moon a sliver. Words breathe, build, spell, hold this text stitched with cotton. You smell the poem, then you see it. My grandfather's hand hanging down, holding mine, my elbow loose, swinging. The sky was apricots, the moon a sliver. Smell the poem, see it. Um, this next one is uh, thinking about my grandmother. So when you hear the name Geneva, that's her. Listening. The cabin her aunt owned in Gatlinburg was outside the city near the mountains. And we must be driving past where it stood when Geneva remembers. She and her mother standing on rocks in the river, watching water snakes, even though her mother feared them. Feeling water in shoes, the hardwood forest still smaller then than it is today. The two of us are on vacation, driving through the Smokies, and she's speaking, speaking to me as I sit silently beside her in the back seat. She tells me she lived in South Knoxville as I do, but she moved back here in high school to help her aunt, a new widow, with her rental cabins, the kitchen, the cash register, how her pop would meet her as she got off the bus and walk her back to White Swan and the tenants. She tells me about the river, the cabin in Gatlinburg, not of the arguments that piled up behind her visit as a teenager, the fights with her mother over returning to Tennessee. She doesn't tell me about leaving my grandfather in Michigan, what it felt like, her desire to graduate early, to marry him, about her mother's disapproval, attempts to make Tennessee home. Instead, she simply tells me about her mother standing in the river, surrounded by her fears, hearing her teenagers discussed for her current situation. She emphasizes the rocks, the stepping across, the standing still, and the sound of water lapping at their feet. She cannot say it was important. She cannot say, in as many words, all fears of loss came true, even if more remained. Perhaps as they stood, the boy rode the train from Michigan to take her back, to marry, have children, grandchildren, build a house, plant an orchard in the backyard, all to pull off to the side of the road, waiting for breath. She cannot say she didn't know then what actions allow a life without knowing it. She cannot say she feels surprise at thankfulness she forgot she owed even for the grief it gave. Instead, she's in Tennessee, trying to place in words an image of her mother in a river, afraid but quiet, listening. And then this next one is about that grandfather. Dear Joseph, sometimes I wonder whether you, where you are now or what it would be to have you here. Hello, no need for repetition. You always heard, no matter where we were. The trailer, the arbor, the pasture, home. Now, following out your voice is what I do, what I try. Take my hand. Lead me to the backfield where deer appear. Lead me to the grapevines, even if they're sour, to the buckeyes, even if the fruit under husk is green. Take my shoulder. 
the back of my neck by fingertip. We'll lead each other through time, through rain, through death, through age, through my body becoming your body, my hands becoming your hands, wide bone splay, rough finger pad, sun. We'll move the concrete blocks from the garden together, create a new kind of structure, say hello from here. So then the next, oh, thanks. Then the next uh, place, I'm only gonna read one um, from this place, but it's my hometown. Hey, Amanda, uh, in rural Michigan. And it's from my dissertation project, which is about uh, how my hometown thinks about itself in relation to race and to whiteness. Um, and this poem, most of the poems from that project haven't been published, um, but I wanted to bring one um, and bring that place into the mix tonight. So um, this one is set up in the form of analogies, if you remember that from high school English classes. Um, so this is a sonnet in analogies. It's called Border Breaking. History is to poetry as archive is to longing. Conversation is to narrative as cicada hum is to bird fight. Cicada hum is to gathering as archive is to paper flight. History is to conversation as bird fight is to song. Death is to an escaped county as love is to sent along. The next house is to another country as distance is to sight. Front door gone is to border breaking as bulb is to firelight. Narrative is to gathering as love is to front door gone. Another country is to death as the next house is to poetry. Gathering is to firelight as border breaking is to love. Parenthood is to heart muscle as no law is to leave. Hiding is to train car as wind gust is to dove. Dove is to heart muscle as parenthood is to leave. Border breaking is to firelight as the next house is to hum. Uh, so this next one is the first poem I've had that's about the place where I live now, which is central Missouri. Um, this was published a few months ago in Three Elements Review, and it is about my daily commute uh, to get to work in Fulton. It's called Poem After Campbell McGrath's Night Travelers. Each evening, my car up the state highway's hill reminds me of a carriage, a line of carriages, and exactly, yes, this place, central Missouri, splitting from each other like a line of ants in the pink glow of late day sun as stars awake. In this dusk, I remember how these carriages, the old and the new, scour paths in the hillsides, scars along the earth's waistline. I'm reminded of wheat fields, combines, quonsets, and kin, while I'm reminded of ash borer, I'm reminded how crops grow in abundance here, waving from the buffeting air I send, and how these are not the plants who call this region home. How a colony's abundance also brings ends, brings shadows, brings more and more, and how the light hits the worn barn side, the wooden fence, how abundance is not health, how number is not increase in every way you might measure it, how wind can create landscape but can also make ill, can buffet time like a pinwheel's paper spin, twist each turn of paper away, against, against, nearly leaving each hand it's in by force, each hand held out the car window, feeling air over, over, under. How do we hold each other without killing each other? Not because there are no other ways to learn a place, but because there are, and others have tried to teach me and I'm still trying to learn how to listen. I'm still trying to learn. I'm still trying. And yet, each evening up the state highway's hill, I wonder what kind of a future am I making? What kind of a future am I making? Thanks, Dad. <laughs> um, 
My last poem is set in Montana where I did my master's in Missoula. Um, and it takes Sappho's um, fragments, fragment 20 in this case, and um, kind of writes a poem from my perspective into the blank spots in, in her poem. I'll just say that for now. Um, thanks everyone for being here and for having me. On waking in the night, at first unable to see and yet knowing. Along the rock beach, after the rain, in the shadows of mountains already swathed the night's storm dark. Gladness for lying beside you rests in the pit of my stomach. The lake water accepts rain from the sky with good luck. Each droplet caught, cupped by open water to gain the harbor of like feeling. Water to water, breath, breath, the dark of black earth needing more soil. And yet, I am awake in difficulty, indifference. The wind beat the side of our tent, making me grateful to not be sailors out on the lake, cold water wrapping feet, choking in big blasts of wind, wishing for any clear path to shore, to safety upon dry land. In fact, it's the storm's noise that woke me. It's after effects of wind in the valley, tree limbs clipped by force as if sail caught by a gale at the point of breaking, recognizing the freight of cedar, juniper, hemlock, fir, of the point when, awakened in the middle of the night with all else, fish to chipmunks, snakes to wolf or elk, all the many sleepers suddenly eyes open to a sky they can't see, we feel the weight of wind held by trees. Imagine breaking as we seek shelter from the rain. In the midst of this blind wakefulness, open to all other senses, my skin works to remind me of your body nearby. The affected has, like dry land, discovered suddenly there, warm. The wind dies down, all takes on a hush, even our breathing. I see almost nothing, but not quite. Thanks. That was great. Um, I mean, I enjoyed getting to hear some of the ones that uh, I heard in workshop before, uh, it was fun. Um, okay, uh, we can open it up now again for a discussion. And I think I saw a question already from Katie, yes. Uh, so she says, there are images and actions in each of your poems that are ordinary, like reading papers or driving to Gatlinburg. Can you all talk about the role of dailiness and the mundane in your work? Hmm. Um, well, the grading papers was me, I guess. Um, and yeah, I mean, Marie Howe, I think, does it best and What the Living Do, uh, just like, it's so exhausting, you know, sometimes just living your life <laughs> and, uh, you know, just like drawing like inspiration from your daily life and put, putting that into poetry, uh, I think is, you know, cool and something that I really like doing. Um, but yeah, that, that's something I think a lot about in my poetry and how surprised I am by how inspired I am by like, you know, kind of housework basically, just like something like sweeping um, that poem. Um, Deborah Diggs also has a really great poem about sweeping, I think, I forget what it's called. Um, but anyway, it opens uh, her collection, Rough Music, and I definitely recommend checking that out. Um, it's one of my favorite poems, and yeah, it seriously just starts with a broom and her sweeping. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's like, there's so much poetic richness in the quotidian or the everyday. Yeah, I, I um, all my friends um, who have known me a really long time kind of make fun of me for writing about similar things all the time. I mean, so, and usually it's, um, I was talking with my friend Nick on the phone a year or two ago, and he, I, he was asking me how the end of grad school was going, and I was trying to describe what I was talking about, not really getting to what I was saying, and he um, he kind of pushed me on it and pushed me on it, and then at some point I said, I mean, you know, it's about memory, and, and he jumped in and said, oh, right, like the M word, <laughs> uh, the thing you always write about, <laughs> um, and so... Uh, I think that one of the things, even though I, I write about a bunch of different places, um, one of the things that kind of connects across them is uh, the way that memory and history show up in the kind of daily 
minute actions that people take um, in the ways their bodies move in space or the ways that they act and, and uh, live in a place in the same way that previous generations did or, um, or the ways they deviate from that. Um, and I'm really interested in the ways that like, I don't know, we've learned how to, how to act in even down to those small minute um, things that we do on the daily, you know, um, and the ways that we unlearn those things too. Um, mm -hmm. I will say, Jeremy, when I uh, was reading your, your poem uh, about driving and thinking of carriages, I was like, wow, that's a real Jeremy move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that question, Katie. That's a good question. Mm, yeah. I kind of, I have a question for Hank that's sure. somewhat related to that one. So um, I was sitting down trying to figure out what poems I would bring and I ended up thinking about place. And then when I was looking at, at your poems, um, the place that kept coming up with different kinds of home. Mm -hmm. And so I wondered um, like, how do you, like how would you describe your speaker's relationship to home in your work? Um, and that might change across different poems because I know there were different homes in there, but um, mm -hmm. it's interesting the way that the home was so central to so many of those. Yeah. Um, yeah, some of the poems, and actually that's kind of something I'm struggling with as I'm revising poet, some poems is that like, I want to write about my life as a married person now, but I have poems that are about this house where I'm currently that it, you know, like, you know, it's my parents' house. And so I like, I don't know, like I have to like act like I'm the man of the house or something. And, you know, it's like, I'm struggling with my relationship and like how to like describe my relationship in terms of place. Um, so, you know, like I, I'd write, I, I want to write poems, you know, as, as an adult person, but I'm like, you know, really inspired by places where I was when I was a kid or, you know, where I'm just living now and doing yard work or whatever. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's an interesting question. And, um, yeah, you can definitely tell, uh, or at least I can tell when I'm reading my poems, like, oh, this is a, you know, a poem where I'm with my wife and you know uh so yeah a lot of it is about relationship and yeah I, I need to kind of strike that balance as i'm working on my own collection and thinking about relationship and home and you know what what i want to do with my poetry so are you guys both working on collections right now definitely yeah i i need to get a book together I, it's been pretty long in the in, in the making mm -hmm. Yeah, I am. I, I mean, I keep moving, so then they, you know, I have to start a new, new idea, new stack of stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it uh, challenging to piece together or to weed out which ones that you want to put in the collection, or to strike a common theme throughout it? Like, do you want to talk about how you're piecing them together? Are you writing the poems specifically for the collection, or are you taking what you have and trying to put them together? Hmm. That's a good question. Uh, I, I guess some poems I'm like trying to massage a bit and fit into like what I want it to do. But most of it is just like I have a bunch of poetry and I need to kind of make them talk to each other and organize them. Um, so, yeah. One of the things that I really enjoy doing. Um, so whenever I move to a new place, I try to learn as much as I can about that place. Um, mm -hmm. and so for a while, at least, the poems just kind of happen naturally because I'm reading the same way they do when I'm reading poetry or reading a novel or something. You know, every once in a while, you have to put the book down and, and write something because it sparked an idea. Um, and the same happens for me when I'm looking into um, the history of a new place to me. And um, so for a while, it's just kind of naturally occurring. But then you kind of hit this point where you... Uh, come over the hill a little bit and you're on the downward trajectory, you kind of see like, these are some of the themes. Um, and I'm no expert on it. I haven't gotten to the end of um, finishing a book project yet, um, but where you can kind of feel what the momentum is a little, and then some new poems come out of like, kind of knowing where that momentum is. Mm -hmm, for sure. Mm -hmm. um. Jeremy, in yours, uh, you tend to use a lot of repetition, I think, and uh, I enjoy that. But I also really liked in one of the ones you read tonight where you were like, this doesn't need repetition. Uh, uh, and so I, I like the like meta-ness of engaging with your own 
habits. Uh, how do you tend to use repetition or do you want to talk about that? Yeah, um, I, I think it's related to um, what I was saying earlier about thinking about history and memory um, showing up in the kind of like daily minute things that we do in our lives. Um, and I think that's true in how we speak too. Um, mm -hmm. I, so that's one of my kind of ticks as a, as a poet, I guess, is that I like repetition a lot. Sometimes I intentionally push against that in order to see where something might go and see if it ends up sounding a little different like the one you're talking about. Um, and other times it's a kind of standing in for all of these other voices that are kind of coming through in my own voice. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it kind of starts to feel like you've got all these other people speaking with you or through you or something. Um, Cause what you say is built on all the things that you've heard other people say or all the things you've read from other people. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in that repetition kind of helps in that way. Mm -hmm. Uh, it looks like, yeah, we've got some questions. Here's another one from Katie that says, how do you balance information and research uh, and music in your work? That's a really good question. Thanks, Katie. Mm -hmm. um, or lyricism, she, she says. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, that's really interesting. It has me kind of thinking about... Um, the people I see as influences or models um, who do a really good job of that, where they're bringing in research in order to just like feel like they can understand to a certain extent the context that they stand within. Um, and a lot of the time, my research is really just an element of that. And, you know, I think a lot of the time um, we think of, and I know Katie, you, you study this more than I do, but we think of um, the lyric form and poetry and the music kind of element of that as around this I or the speaker. Um, and for me, at least, um, the research is like trying to dig into the complexity of the context that speaker's in, right? And um, understand that historical situatedness or that um, geography, all the different kinds of geographies around that, that speaker. Um, and so they kind of go hand in hand. I, I write in a kind of lyric way, um, but I'm trying to understand where that lyric is coming from, you know, or where that voice can come from. Uh, yeah. And that kind of ties into the um, idea that we were talking about before with like the mundane and the kind of elevation that poetry gives it. So then you've got the history and the elevation of lyricism. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we've got, well, Richard asked a question for Hank that says, if you were a Dominion card, which would you be? <laughs> <laughs> Secret chamber, man, uh, you know. <laughs> uh, um, I, I do have a question for Jeremy that kind of relates to uh, what he was just talking about. So mm -hmm. um, in listening, I feel like you somehow make the speaker of the poem invisible, which is really interesting. You know, like you're sitting in the back of a car listening to your grandma, who I didn't realize was your grandma when I read the poem. But um, uh, so do you find that speaker changing as you write new poems, like I, especially comparing it to poem after Campbell McGrath. Um, it seems like the, the poet or the speaker rather is like asking the natural world for sort of like help basically. Like I, I was interested in those two poems, how they use the, the natural world and how the speaker interacted with the natural world. Like in listening, you know, it's uh, snakes and a river and kind of fear and in poem after Campbell McGrath, like the, the speaker is like very pronounced and like almost begging the world to answer his questions about it. Um, so do you see your speaker changing in relationship to the natural world, I guess, as you, because I'm guessing poem after Campbell McGrath is a newer poem poem because it's about Missouri. Right. Yeah, it is. So I'm going to flip this question back at you in a second, because my other question. Oh, no. You, uh. Yeah, I know. <laughs> my other question for you was about how you understand the non-human elements in your work, too. Um, okay. and, yeah, and I'll just leave it at that for now. OK, so um, to answer and give you a minute to think about your answer, too, the um, yeah, it's interesting to think about my speaker as a little invisible in some of the poems. And I think I 
I understand that and see that too. Um, I think that's a that's part of where I am trying to grow into as a writer right now is to make that person a little bit more present. Um, in terms of the question that Katie had, into digging into the context of that I, like you still need the I, <laughs> you still need to own up to who that is and um, all of the kind of different, oh, thanks Katie, um, all of the different um, specific ways that that person has a, of existing, right? So um, if you're too invisible, then you're, even while you're bringing it into the poem, you might not be recognizing fully that like in my case, you're a, a guy <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, a cis and, and a hetero guy who's white and exists in the Midwest and uh, has all of these different kinds of layers of why they speak the way they speak and why they notice what they notice. And, um, you know, so I think my poems and that one in particular too, you know, is, is thinking about what's my role here? Am I a, a you know, colonial carriage in a way myself? Um, mm -hmm. uh, what are the ethical questions that go along with my driving on this road? Um, or owning a house, you know, um, that is on land that was unseated, you know, um, there's a lot of kind of questions to ask with a, with a body like mine. So um, I'm kind of interested in, in bringing that in more. And I think that's true for the landscapes too, to a certain extent, like if there are voices that are speaking through my voice and the way that I talk, there are also um, a lot of different people that have existed on the same place or the places I drive by, or the places I work or live. And, um, you know, I have to kind of think about their presences too. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, but your poems, I think, are, like I said, interested in home, but another element that I noticed in almost every poem was some kind of non-human element, whether it was a deer in the lake or the toad, okay. or um, we can get to the myths in a second, but, you know, there were all of these uh, animals and, um, you know, things that were around in the space with you as the speaker. Um, how do you see the non-human element in your stuff? Uh, well, I, I just wanted to say, like, I, I didn't mean an invisible speaker as a bad thing. As, as someone who kind of struggles with, like, you know, having too much of myself in, in my poems, I think I was kind of jealous <laughs> as reading your poetry and being like, man, I, I can't even see the speaker in, like, these conversations, the the imagined conversation, you know, because it's really just a monologue listening, like your, your grandmother is kind of talking the whole time and you're kind of thinking like, this is what she isn't saying. Uh, so I guess the speaker is kind of in there in that way. But, you know, I, I really appreciated how the, uh, the speaker like didn't intrude on what your grandmother had to say and that really powerful memory with your mother. Um, and uh, basically, as for my own poetry and the, the non-human elements, um, with a poem like weeding, uh, you know, I'm just like, I'm doing yard work and there's a, there's a toad, like, you know, there was an actual toad and, <laughs> you know, like I, I'm not that creative. I just, you know, I see what's around me and, uh, you know, whatever kind of fits the voice of the poem and get, gets, you know, carries that enthusiasm and excitement or whatever is, is what works. So, you know, some of it is of course fabricate, fabricated, um, but no, there was really a dead deer in our pond too. Uh, that's that's all all real. Um, so it's basically just uh, I'm a newspaper reporter, Jeremy. And that's uh, <laughs> that's the sad fact. <laughs> um, Bryn had a question in the comments that says, uh, "What's something that has you jazzed or excited right now? A poem, book, project of your own, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. You want to take this one first? Uh. Hmm, no, maybe you should take it first. I can't think of anything really. <laughs> um, well, one of the things that has me jazzed and excited right now are all of these at-home readings. Where they're not, yeah, they're from everyone's homes, I guess, but I can watch them from my home. And um, and I really enjoyed the ones that you've been putting on, and I've been kind of catching up on some of the other ones that have been happening. Um, there's so many good books out in the world right now um, mm -hmm. that we aren't getting to see. Thanks, Alicia. Um, we aren't getting to see in bookstores, unfortunately, in person, um, but that we get to see online. So a few like recent books that have come out that are really um, inspiring to me. Me too. Um, <laughs> was, uh, so one for sure is uh, Katie Condon's book. And I know she read with you all, but Praying Naked is an incredible book. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, and another one of, I mean, so many of the readers you've had on have been really great. Julia Dasbach's Don't Touch the Bomb mm -hmm. is incredible. Um, Lisa Marjan's book is really great too, in terms of things that are really recent. Um, those are some of the things I've been reading lately. Um, yeah, I did want to say that like, yeah, just reading over Jeremy's poetry before this reading and yeah, getting to see Katie Condon read a couple weeks ago and being a part of this reading has really made me excited to work on my own stuff, uh, which is something that has not been happening over the quarantine. So like, I think this is exactly what I needed to get serious about, you know, getting back to my poetry. So thanks, Nicole and Jeremy. Thank you. Um, did you want to ask Hank about his mythology? Yeah, well, and I think, yeah, I, I did. I wanted to know kind of how you saw that element working too. Um, Caroline actually just asked a question about that. So maybe oh. I'll use her. Well, thank you, Nicole. Both of your Minotaur poems had comedic elements. What drew you to the Minotaur as a potentially humorous figure? Uh, do you want to start, Hank? Uh, sure. Um, I mean, he's a monster and I guess I just like kind of like the idea of you know just encountering this monster like in in that poem and just like like just you know some nobody like living in Athens or some ancient Greece and just like his take on like god what are we doing about this thing like this is a serious problem um so and yeah I, I definitely wrote like more comedic poetry uh back in the day. And um, yeah, I, I, that that definitely gave me, uh, inspired me to write about the Minotaur as kind of a comedic element was just like sort of the perspective of how do we deal with this like horrid thing, you know, that just demands so much and is, you know, like has all of these really cool stories behind it. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, I think the myths are kind of funny in themselves just at how quirky they are, you know, like how many weird details there are in the story of the Minotaur. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's there's funny things in that story. Yeah. Um, I haven't read any of my poetry, but what they've alluded to uh, is that I wrote for my thesis for MFA um, a collection about the Minotaur in the modern world. Um, mm -hmm. So the comedic elements for me, I'd say, are that I tend to think that the rules of poetry and the rules of comedy are pretty similar in that, like, uh, leaning into the unexpected and things like that, or putting opposites together uh, makes for a better poem. Mm -hmm. uh, so like we talked about the mundane and the elevated, uh, is like information versus lyricism. And I think comedy and uh, like monsters also ties into that, or like things that are typically treated seriously um, and then treating them in a comic way makes for a more exciting and engaging text. I don't know, and I just tend to like humor, and so when I was writing in the voice of the Minotaur, I put humor in. Um, I have okay. uh, another question for uh, Jeremy. Um, mm -hmm. Involving form, uh, border breaking is a perfect Petrarchan sonnet. When you look at it on the page, uh, I didn't know about the whole um, analogy thing when I was looking at it on the page. But on the page, it's 14 lines. It rhymes almost perfectly in a Petrarchan scheme. Um, and your uh, your poem, Hand Stitched, is a villanelle. And as I was reading it, um, it has a epigraph, you know, uh, saying to Nikki or after Nikki Finney, I believe. Um, but it really reminded me of Bishop's One Art. Um, and I was wondering if you had that excellent villanelle in mind uh and at, just uh, to finish my question um the similarities that your poem has with bishop's one art is like a heavy use of second person it reflects back on the creation of the poem and um it moves from the general to the personal uh which are all, all three things uh, bishop does in one art as well thanks for reading that so closely hank um oh, sure. i think um, I think of form, I mean, in part because I am interested in repetition already. Um, and so when I, I notice in a draft that's coming out, you know, that there are some elements of that in there, I might try out a form that seems it's like leading that way, um, mm -hmm. to give it a little bit of structure. Um, and so I don't just end up kind of like repeating myself over and over again, um, but that it can head somewhere. And, um, 
I don't know if I was thinking about one art in particular beyond the fact that like every time I sit down to do a Villanelle, I kind of think about one art. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, I, there are times where I'll think about like, what is a Villanelle again? And uh, like one art is what I'll Google, right? Yeah. And you can read through really carefully and, and it pops right back into your mind. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I the, the note there that it's after Nikki Finney is because she gave a reading at um, University of Tennessee a few years back when I was there. And she um, gave us all a prompt. She, she was talking after her reading and um, saying some stuff about things that she'd been looking into recently. She'd been reading Denise Levertov's journals. Um, and that's where this idea of smelling a poem came from. And, um, okay. and she kind of turned to all of us and said, you should write a poem about your earliest memory. Uh, and so that's my earliest memory. Um, and yeah, I just was kind of looking for a form to put in these kind of fragmented um, images that I had from when I was really young um, so that they could right. on each other. And a villain that's great for that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know that Richard's question is super serious, but uh, he says Marion Moore said that poets should create imaginary gardens with real toads in them. Would you consider imaginary gardens as your dominion card? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, that sounds like a, a I, you know, a secret chamber, I think, could be upgraded to imaginary gardens. I, I'm, I'm down for that, Richard. Thanks. <laughs> and you did create a garden with toads in it and a real toad, yeah. as we all discussed. Oh. <laughs> well, so I know Nicole asked us to think about book recommendations for people. Mm -hmm. um, and I was really interested to hear what yours would be, Hank. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, I am very excited to read Robert Haas's Summer Snow. Um, I have it somewhere. Uh, but um, yeah, uh, this came out, I think, maybe in the spring. Um, and yeah, uh, uh, another book that I, I don't know if I would really claim it as an influence, but um, I, I've read a bunch is Tracy K. Smith's uh, Wade in the Water, mm -hmm. um, one of my favorites for sure. And uh, these next poets are definitely all inspirations and people I would say like had a direct influence on my work. Uh, Deborah Diggs, I already mentioned her actually uh, with the poem about sweeping um, is, you know, I basically just stole that idea from her. Um, but yeah, uh, Deborah Diggs's rough music is great um, and definitely an influence. Uh, Beth Gillis was one of my teachers at GSU, and her po her um, collection "Sky Blue Enough to Drink" is one of my favorites from her. And yeah, she's a great poet and a great teacher. Um, and Carol Musky Dukes is another poet that um, I, I think, like, I really learned um, about the importance of stanzas from her. Like, she writes most of her poems in quatrains, and like, I never even touched a quatrain before I encountered uh, Musky Dukes. Like, my stanzas were always just kind of like you know whatever they were shaped like um but after i read her work and kind of realized the power that the stanza had on her poetry i like started organizing my own poetry in quatrains or tercets or whatever and um i i definitely felt a difference mm -hmm. what, about, uh, what you, about you jeremy um yeah i was thinking about um well so in terms of teachers um joy harjo um, is really important for me. And her most recent book is An American Sunrise. It's really uh, a great book. Um, and I'm really excited she gets a second year as Poet Laureate. Um, so that she yeah. can be working on her map mapping project. Um, yeah, so when I was thinking about book recommendations and books that have just been really important to me in the last year, I guess, um, I was thinking about how when we talk about influences, um, I don't always hear people talk about the influence that the work they've edited has on them. But um, mm -hmm. being editor of Grist was really important to me. And I encountered a lot of work there for the first time that um, has really stuck with me, especially as some of those writers have gone on to write their first books. Um, mm -hmm. And so a few that I was thinking about that are just really important to me, um, Caleb Ray Kendrilli's What Runs Over um, from Yes, Yes. That's an incredible book. and. Um, their second book, All the Gay Saints, comes out next week. I'm really excited to read it. Um, Tiana Clark, who you had on here um, mm -hmm. last week, 
I Can't Talk About the Trees Without the Blood is incredible. And I, I teach poems by her in my classes. Um, Julia Bozma's Midden uh, won the Poets Out Loud Prize a few years back. And um, it's just incredible. It's kind of a documentary poetry, interested in historical research, but also that lyric guy that Katie was asking about. Um, and she lives in rural Maine and is talking about the history there. Um, and then Lindsay Alexander, Rodeo in Reverse is just such an incredible book um, in terms of tone and point of view and all of the different things that it brings into the world of that book. Um, she's really incredible. So um, those were a few that I had in mind. Um, and then, yeah, all the people that you've had on here, Nicole, have been great. Mm -hmm. Edgar and Connor and um, Luisa and Julia, they're all really important poets to me too. And I know we definitely have some of the ones that you've mentioned currently in the store. Like we have American Sunrise and we've got Rodeo in Reverse um, and then Tiana Clark's and Katie Condon's. Uh, so we definitely already have a few because uh, I, I also met with Lindsay Alexander when we were in Tennessee and that is a very good, very good collection. I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you guys have more questions for each other or? Hmm. I kind of had only have like nine minutes, but yeah, I I had one. Um, so we were kind of asked to think about craft, and I wondered, Hank. Um, I was asked this question the other day by a student, and I was still thinking about what a good answer would be later. Um, and I wondered what you think about this. But um, what's your writing process uh, like, or how would you describe it? Kind of generally, but what's it been like since um, all of the kind of quarantine or stay at home orders have been in place? Um, mm -hmm. Or how would you like approach answering that question from a student, like a beginning writer who's interested in writing, but doesn't is trying to figure out how to do that from home now? Um, well, that's, that's a, a quarantine answer. thing would like, <laughs> yeah, that would be another layer <laughs> that I'm kind of unprepared to answer because you know, I, just, I haven't done any writing really during the quarantine. And uh, like my life is sort of unchanged by the quarantine just because I'm, you know, I kind of like to stay inside anyway. Um, so I feel like I'd rather answer that question without the quarantine layer on it. Can I do that? Yeah. Okay. Um, which is just, you know, take a hike, man, like go for a drive and just like see what happens. And, you know, like, like that's how almost all of my poems start with just like some interesting thing that happened to me while I was driving around, uh, you know, hiking, whatever. And, uh, you know, something, uh, from the natural world that like really got me excited and something that sparked, sparked some language. And then the poem just kind of grows organically from there. Um, so yeah, do some weeding, do some sweeping, you know, and the poetry will come. Uh, how did you answer the question, Jeremy? I mean, I from what I remember of what I said, you know, that moment when a, a student asks you something and you kind of like respond and then afterward you're like, what did I really say? Um, <laughs> but I, I mean, what I, what I told them was um, to just not worry too much about producing right now. Um, like to write when you feel like you want to write, but also make space for all the other things that are um, new and pressing in this, in this context. And that those are important things too, to just pay attention to what life's like and stuff will come around eventually. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, well, uh, we covered a lot of good ground, I think, uh, and I enjoyed this a lot. Thank you both for reading. Uh, I think we could go ahead and call it a night, uh, but thanks for coming out everybody and listening. And uh, you should check out more of their poetry where it's published online or in the future when it will be. I'm sure. Um, so thank you, everybody, and good night. Thanks, Nicole. Thank Thanks. you, Zach. Bye.